<laughs> come on in. It's fine. No problem. No worries. Everybody, come on in. Uh, my name's Todd, and this is, uh, this is my talk on how I automated my barn. It used to have a really long title. In fact, if you look at the agenda, you'd probably see that. And it got to be so ever-changing and long that I just made it dot, dot, dot. So this is how I automated my barn. I've used uh, all kinds of cool things. It's a really fun talk. Um, I'm very easygoing. If you have questions, if you want to laugh, if you want to cry, whatever, I'm cool with it all. So um, we're here to have some fun and learn some cool things and look at some cool things and share. If you have experiences that you want to share, I'm glad to hear those too. So uh, let's get started. And uh, well, actually, before I do that, um, so I live in Georgia right now, and there's a, a thing in Georgia where um, if you're invited to be somebody's guest, you always bring a gift to them. So um, I wanted to bring a gift for everybody, and um, what I originally planned on was, where's the line? Okay, there. Uh, I had some awesome Oracle shirts ready to go, and apparently we had a supplier issue, so they didn't make it, so... Um, instead, you have to settle for some crappy American candy, so uh, take one, help yourself, get some sugar before the beer. Here, you can open those. <laughs> and uh, we'll have, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> this guy knows what's up. Um, we're going to look at Cleveland in a minute here, buddy. Um, <laughs> this is Oracle Safe Harbor Statement. It says stuff that you should or should not do, and that's all about that. Uh, so about me. First and foremost, I always think of myself as a developer. Um, I may be paid to be an evangelist today, but I have been a developer for 15 years, and in my mind, I will always be a developer, and I think that any kind of developer relations person or advocate or evangelist, whatever you want to call yourself, should always be a developer. Um, to me, that's the only way this works. Um, if I was wearing a suit up here and telling you all kinds of businessy stuff, you wouldn't, I mean, I've been in your seat many times. You wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't want to hear me talk, so. I wouldn't want to hear me talk. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm a Groovy and Grails developer. I started off in 2004 with a language called Cold Fusion. Is anybody willing to admit that they were also a Cold Fusion developer? Yeah, there's always a few. I uh, have my condolences to you. Now, Cold Fusion was great. It, was, it got me in the door, and uh, I have nothing bad to say about it, but I'm glad that I made the transition to Groovy and Grails around 2011. Uh, but I'm, as I said, I'm a full-stack developer, so I'm just as comfortable on the front end with Angular, Node, uh, which is not front end, but with uh, Angular, JavaScript, TypeScript, those kind of things. As I said, I'm a cloud developer advocate. I work at Oracle. Uh, was hired as a cloud advocate, and then a couple months back, I recently moved to the database team under Gerald Benzel, uh, who's an awesome guy. And so I'm on the database team, but I'm still a cloud developer advocate. I still uh, basically talk about Oracle Cloud, and I just try to focus a little bit more on the database and slip that in and make sure that it's relevant when it's possible. So as I said, I'm currently at a small company you may have heard of called Oracle. Formerly, I worked at AT&T and a government consulting firm in the States called Booz Allen Hamilton. So I was born here. And Max already spoiled it for me. But uh, this is a beautiful city called Cleveland, Ohio, in the Great Lakes region of the U.S. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with U.S. geography, but it's kind of in the northeast corner of this country. Um, and yeah, this is a beautiful picture of the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland. Uh, and this is also a picture of the Cuyahoga River <laughs> in Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do this. Uh, <laughs> so let me get this out there. So 
Mac, you can uh, attest to this or not, right? People from Ohio, I mean, it's kind of the butt of the joke sometimes in America, right? I mean, at least Cleveland is, that's for sure. Um, it's, uh, it has a long history, tortured history of sports, and any Americans will agree with me and understand that. Where's Jeff at? Uh, Jeff Beck. There he is. Uh, well, either Jeff. So you all know Cleveland sports history, right? I mean, we have one championship in the last 55 years. 55 years, that's like older than me. Um, but so we tend to laugh at, each other, at ourselves in, in Cleveland. And from what I've read, and maybe it's wrong, but uh, that kind of is part of the Danish, uh, you know, it's, if you can't laugh at yourself, you know, then, you know, it's, it's common from what I've read, and maybe I'm wrong, but the Danish are okay with laughing at themselves. So I like to laugh at myself. Um, and um, a few, year, 10 years ago now, I think, uh, there was some, a series of, a couple YouTube videos called these hastily made Cleveland tourism videos. <laughs> and the, the, the joke was that, you know, Cleveland's the, the butt of the joke, and we're going to do these videos to show, uh, to bring tourism to Cleveland. And uh, the tagline they came up with was this. <laughs> nah. Uh, it's almost good enough to be true. Um, there's another meme here. Uh, yeah. Um, but it, go ahead, what? Did someone say something? No, go ahead. Let's, like, hey, it's almost beer time. Let's talk. Let's have fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's not all bad, right? So Ohio has a pretty rich history uh, when it comes to certain things. Um, seven, I believe, presidents were born in Ohio, seven U.S. presidents, which is a pretty big number, you know, compared to some of the other states. Um, the Wright brothers were born in Ohio, the, you know, basically the fathers of modern flight, uh, as well as 24 astronauts that have gone into space were born in the state of Ohio, which begs the question... I don't know. No. Um, but it's all in fun. Uh, I don't live there any longer, but I, I am proud to be from there, and uh, it's fun to laugh at ourselves sometimes. So, I got to thinking. Does anybody know what these are? What this is? No one's familiar with this? I, don't, I wasn't sure if the... the uh, yeah. Ryan, you're, you're, you've seen this before? So, when I was a kid, um, I got to thinking after Michael was talking yesterday, some about uh, his, uh, his humble beginnings, you know, in, as being a magician in a, in a restaurant and, and how he kind of came to be. So I got to thinking a little bit about what made me who I am. And this was one of the first things that came to mind. This is called a 150 in one electronics project kit. And they used to be sold when I was like seven, eight years old in the 80s. Um, at least that's when I got one. The Radio Shack, the store, is a little electronic store, and they would sell these little kits, well, among other things. And I got one of these when I was like seven years old. And I kind of think of it as my, really my gateway into being a geek um, as I look back at it. So it was this really cool project kit. And, you know, it had meters and relays and resistors and capacitors and radio circuits. And these little silver guys right here are like these spring-loaded terminals. And you would bend them back and you could place a wire between the, s the spring and, and, and it would make a connection. So you would, and it came with this big instruction book, 150 different projects. In this particular example, they had other ones, 101 kit, 401 kit. And they had this book of projects you could do. So you would hook, uh, put some batteries in it over on the side over there, and you'd wire these circuits up. So you'd take these little jumper wires, like you see in the bottom corner there, that little, and that's usually what happened to them. They would become this rat's nest of wires, or you'd lose them, or mom would vacuum them up, and you'd be out of luck. Um, 
but you'd build these little circuits like radios and buzzers and things like that, right? And I kind of think of it as my, almost like my gateway into this industry. Is if you think about uh, an electrical circuit, right, um, it's kind of similar to programming, right? You would take, instead of instructions or requirements, and you would follow a pres prescribed series of steps to make a circuit. And uh, it also kind of fulfilled that curiosity of mine of, okay, what happens if I switch it to this capacitor? What happens if I switch it to this resistor and see what happens? Can I make it louder? Can I make it faster? Can I make it, uh, can I cash it? No, no, wait, no. Um, so, so I kind of think of it as my intro into to being a geek. Um, and the other story that I thought of when Michael was talking about his beginnings was when I was 19 years old, uh, as I said, I worked at AT&T. I spent a year uh, in college right out of high school. And um, when I was 19, my dad get, got me an opportunity to be an intern at AT&T, the phone company, telephone company. And the original plan was, hey, you just come, this is your summer job after your first year of college, and uh, you go back to college in the fall after the summer, and it's good experience, good money for, for a kid at the time to have a full-time job over summer break. Um, it didn't quite end up that way, but uh, one experience that I had during that time, uh, I, I kind of think back at, and I'm kind of glad I had it, and it was, I was on an air pressure crew. So in telephone cables, the old copper cables, um, some of the older ones were lead sheaths of cable, and the individual telephone lines inside were paper-wrapped copper because they didn't have plastic in the early 1900s, right? So they wrapped them with paper. Well, to, and they would run in these ducts underground, and they were connected by manholes. You, you know, some, not a foreign concept. Um, but these cables were put under air pressure to keep water out of them, right? So if the sheath was compromised, the air pressure would, would continually blow out so the water couldn't get in because if water gets on paper, your whole cable's shorted and you're, you're in a mess, right? So I was on the air pressure crew at my first summer at AT&T and our job was to monitor the alarms on these air pressure systems and go and repair, because you can't, it's not a permanent fix to, you know, you have to go repair the cable. You can't hope the air forever keeps <laughs> the water out. So my job was to be a helper on the air pressure crew. And uh, so the memory I have was one day we went to uh, this manhole. We had an alarm, and we popped the manhole lid. And this was in downtown Cleveland, the city that we saw earlier, right in the center of downtown, real busy, hot summer day. And we popped the lid on the manhole, and it's a big, deep manhole. It's like 10, 12 feet deep. Things full, to, full of water, right? Just nasty, mucky, gross water. And um, so we take the pump, we drop it in the manhole, turn on the pump, go get a coffee, drink coffee. You've seen American workers, you know, leaning on the drinking their coffee. Well, that's what they're doing. Usually, they're not always being lazy. They're waiting for something else to happen. Um, so the pump, the, the water comes out of the manhole, and he gives me this paper suit, and I put this suit on, and it's like, uh, it's like a, you know, a hazmat suit kind of thing. It's just this paper suit, and you zip it up, and you put your gloves on and your hard hat, and he says, all right, go on down. So I climb down the ladder. I get to the bottom, and it's just muck everywhere. Just, you know, mud and nasty, gross stuff. So I get down there, and I look up, and I see this bucket start coming down. He has a rope, and he's lowering this bucket down. And I look back up, and he throws me a coffee can. And he goes, all right, get all the mud up. So I'm scooping this mud. And I just think back to that time, and I, and not that there's anything at all wrong with being a manual, you know, doing manual work or stuff like that. But I always kind of, at that moment, kind of feel like I thought, you know, this is not what I want to be doing in 20 years, and um, I need to make sure uh, that I go back to school and, and, and pay attention. And 
Uh, so I don't know, it just kind of uh, is a story that I think of from time to time when it comes to uh, getting where I am today. Um, I'm a self-taught developer, and I hate, that, I hate that phrase because to me it kind of implies that I did something great and taught myself something, and pretty much really what it really means is uh, I didn't go the traditional route. Um, you know, I didn't go to college and, and go through computer science classes, but that doesn't mean that there's not a ton of people that helped me to become the developer that I am today, right? Um, when I started in 2004, there was, back then, I kind of wish it was still this way. I feel like it isn't. But there were so many blog posts. And yeah, I know there's blog posts today, but it seems to me like with the Twitter age kind of and all the other ways to share things, it feels like blogs are not as prevalent and popular as they used to be. Maybe it's just me. Um, but so many blog posts that I read and uh, YouTube videos and conferences, conferences. Um, when started going to conferences out of my own pocket, uh, paying for my own trips to them because uh, I kind of figured they would be a good way to kind of drink from the fire hose, right? And um, you get introduced and inspired to so many different topics at conferences. Um, I, if you're, how many, anybody, this is their first conference ever? Yeah, you, a couple? How many have been to every great conf? <laughs> Um, so we have a range, right? But, uh, you know, some people, some wives, I don't know, maybe, some husbands, think that we just come here and, and just drink up and just live it up. And, but it's, more, it's m so much more than that, right? I mean, that's part of it, but... Okay, that's a big part of it. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> don't let my wife watch this. No, just kidding. Um, that's part of it, but really, it, you can learn so much. I sat with Andres earlier and learned more about Gradle in a half an hour than I've learned from anything that I've read or watched online about Gradle. And that's invaluable, right? I mean, he's doing his job. He's showing his passion and telling me about the product that he loves, but... I got so much out of just sitting there with him and talking for a half an hour, so much more than I could have gotten if I went home and, and read the entire document. It's that real-life experience that we get from coming to conferences. Um, both of my last, well, both of my last, my last two jobs that I've gotten in this industry, uh, one at Booz Allen Consulting and one at Oracle, both of those jobs are a direct result of people that I met at conferences. So, excuse me. Um, the first one was he got to know me due to some, and, and another big important thing is uh, he got to know me through some of my open source contri contributions at the time. He saw my projects that I had put out there, and uh, we met at a conference, hit it off, and he wanted me to join his team, and it, it took a year before I was brave enough to join, um, but I did, and I, I don't regret it, and it was probably one of the best moves, it was the best move in my career uh, going to that firm. Uh, after I moved to Georgia, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but uh, I met another guy, Vincent Myers, at uh, DevNexus in Atlanta conference. He's one of the organizers. He works at Oracle. He called me March of last year, and he said, hey, we have an opening for Cloud Evangelist. Do you want to, are you interested? I said, sure, let's. So my point being, the connections that you make here, you may not realize it, but they can really affect the, the trajectory of your career. And uh, hey, come on in. You got any beer? <laughs> <laughs> um, see, the networking is invaluable. The the topics that you can uh, learn about and be introduced to, uh, the people that you can sit down with and, and just pick their brain who are more than willing to do it. Jeff, you know, Brown, Jeff Beck, all these guys that you can, that are just these experts on their particular area of expertise. Michael, uh, everyone, you know, I don't mean to exclude anyone. Jen, I mean, I know some people have talked about sitting down with you and uh, Mac. It's just... Conferences are 
awesome. I, will, I, I love that I can do this as part of my job and that I get to come and talk to people, and I'm starting to ramble, so I'll move forward. Yeah, we're running out of time here. Um, so anyways, after I got out of the manhole, a couple years later, uh, I got married and I moved to Medina, Ohio. It's a little town in the suburbs. And then in 2014, my wife and I were kind of getting to the point, um, and I've talked to some other people here, it's, it's funny that our getting to the same point, but we got to the point where our kids were eight and six, and we were living in the suburbs, both of us working full-time, uh, you know, these 12-hour, 13-hour days, both of us, you know, you wake up at 7 a.m., and you get the kids off to school, we, you know, she goes to work, I go to work, well, I work from home at the time, uh, but my son was in kindergarten, so I would have to go get him, he was, it was only half day, um, so I would have to go get him at 11.30, come back home, feed him lunch. So it's just, point being, we were going crazy killing ourselves, and we said, you know what, if we're not careful, 10 years from now, 12 years from now, they're going to be gone, and we've just wasted our, our children's childhood. So we said, we need to do something about this. And we took the crazy, sometimes thinking step of moving 600 miles away. And my wife quit her job, and uh, it worked out awesome because we had time to spend with our kids. We had time to spend with each other and build our relationship, which is uh, obviously important. And we moved here. This is a, a town called Blairsville, Georgia. It's two hours north of Atlanta, uh, kind of on the North Carolina border. Uh, beautiful lakes, forests, mountains. Uh, it's the start of the Appalachian Trail, which goes from... 10 minutes away from my house all the way up to Maine. Huge trail. People hike the entire thing sometimes. It takes them like three months to do the entire trail. It's so long. It's like, I guess, how, how, lo how long is Denmark miles? Anybody know? It's probably like four Denmarks long, I would guess. <laughs> Just guessing here. Um, but the reason I tell you some of this uh, about me moving to, <laughs> starting in Cleveland, moving to Georgia, is so that you don't think I'm some sort of just redneck Southern American hillbilly. Um, I do have some kind of different background. Um, but one of the things that we did when we moved to Georgia is what a lot of people do, and we started a little, what they call a hobby farm. We got a pig, we got originally eight chickens, now six chickens, unfortunately. And we built a little pasture and uh, quickly kind of learned that owning a barn is a lot of work. And owning animals is a lot of work, right? Uh, every morning you have to open up the barn, let the animals out, make sure they have their, f their food. Uh, this time of year it's like 36 Celsius, so it's like super hot, so you have to make sure they have fresh water. You have to put ice in the water every few hours to make sure it doesn't get too hot. Uh, you have to clean up the barn, and that's, <laughs> if there's one thing I could automate, it would be scooping up chicken poo. Um, but I haven't figured that one out yet. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a lot of work. And at the time, I was working with Booz Allen, and some of our customers were using Linux servers, and I wanted to learn more about Linux. And that you're tr probably asking yourself, how in the hell does a barn have anything to do with Linux? Um, but one of the things that all I had also wanted to do was learn more about Raspberry Pis. Um, and so what I did was I built a little system. And I got some wires and sensors and a Raspberry Pi and a webcam. And I put it in this little enclosure. You have your temperature sensor over here. You have the webcam right there. You have a door sensor up there. And I built this little system so that I could do some basic automation, but nothing like crazy. You know, it was, like I said, just an excuse for me to learn more, actually use Linux, you know, get into the, the Raspbian operating system and play around, and how can I deploy an app on here? How can I, how do I update packages? And it, so this was like five years ago, and I, I really, uh, it was really a, a fun thing to do. And now that I think about it, um, that kind of looks like that 150 in one kit, 
that I played with as a kid, so maybe there is a little bit of nostalgia involved with me geeking out and, and uh, creating these circuits and that. Um, so this is what I like to call version one. It had temperature and humidity monitoring. There was a door sensor, a flame sensor, just in case the barn caught fire. RF outlets uh, that I could control via scheduled tasks or on demand, which is kind of cool. That meant that there was one less thing I would have to do every night, because every night when my chickens would come in, their door would be open, but it was kind of dark inside the barn, because they don't, chickens will come in to the barn when they're ready for bed every night. Uh, you don't have to round them up, because <laughs> that would be pretty difficult. But they will come in, but they can't see to get up on the on the roost because it's so dark in there. So uh, I used this Java package that tells you sunset and uh, sunrise and sunset every day, and I created a scheduled task every day that 30 minutes before sunset, turn these lights on, and 45 minutes after, when they're all up there and settled, just to give them some time, uh, turn them off. So that was one less thing I had to do. I added a webcam so that I could kind of keep tabs on things and see what's going on. Uh, if I wanted to know if all the chickens were inside and on their roost before I went out and shut the barn, I could pull it up on my phone, click the webcam stream button, feed, and make sure, count them all, yep, they're all in, let me go out and close the barn. So it was something to just tinker with, but it, it did provide some value. Of course, I learned a lot through the process of creating it. And this app, by the way, is a Grails 3 app, and that was another excuse that I, we were using Grails 2.5 uh, at work at the time because, um, and I'm sure you guys can, can uh, understand this, being a government contractor, sometimes you're a version or two behind the rest of the world because of approvals and testing. So we were a little far behind on, on Grails, so I wanted to learn the latest Grails, and so I created this app. How long has Grails 3 been out, Jeff? Do you know? I do. I started it last week. Let's hear it. Okay, so then that must be when I created this. Okay. <laughs> what about 2-1? <two> <laughs> um, okay. I'll talk to you more later about that. Um, so, you know, it was a great project for me to learn, and it did provide some value. Uh, but if you want to think about it in terms of being a true automation type system, it did have some shortcomings, right? Um, one being that it wasn't web accessible. I couldn't access it outside of my local network because the web app ran on the Raspberry Pi, and I didn't want to take the risk of opening up firewall ports and having potential, you know, because everybody wants to hack a barn in <laughs> North Georgia. No, but, you know, if you open that firewall port, you're opening yourself up to vulnerabilities, and I didn't want to mess with that. Um, Plus, I did try doing it once, and my ISP said, yeah, it's wide open. Go ahead. You're good. And I tried it, and it didn't work. Um, so I think they lied to me. And it had limited features, right? Um, as far as an automation system goes, there was no motorized doors. I couldn't open any doors, close any doors. Um, I couldn't do any feeding or watering or anything like that. Um, and there was no data persistence at all. It was just all on-demand data. When you open the web app, it would read the sensor and provide that data. You could refresh the page, of course, um, to get the latest value, but there was no push or anything, and there was no data persistence. Um, so the door sensor, you know, if my son told me, if I asked him to close the barn last night, and he said, sure, Dad, yeah, I'll, I'll do that, and, and he didn't, I have no way of looking at a log of data and saying, no, you didn't. The door was open all night. Um, so, you know, I wanted to add some data persistence. Um, so when I joined Oracle in September, I was uh, once again faced with this enormous task of learning a whole lot of stuff in a very short period of time. Uh, Oracle Cloud has tons of products, and I wanted to learn as much about everything that I could in a short period of time. So um, I thought, well, why don't I revisit this barn project and see what I could do and, and actually kind of do some things that uh, I didn't do the first time around. Um, and so those requirements are obviously it had to be cloud-based, right? I mean, it wouldn't make much sense <laughs> if I didn't cloud-base it. Um, but on top of that, I wanted to have a real-time web-based interface so that 
the sensor data would, yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's it. Thank you, sir. Micro IPA. This is a preview. Very good. I won't get into like a beer advocate review of it or anything right now. <laughs> that is good. Um, so I wanted that real-time web-based interface. So I wanted to basically push the sensor data to the browser in as close to real-time as I possibly could. I wanted to add data persistence so that I could do trend analysis, perhaps, uh, maybe do some machine learning on the data, uh, you know, compare temperature to water level or, you know, light, ambient light level to something else, whatever. Just the ability to do that would be possible if I had data persistence. I wanted to have automated feeding and watering because obviously any kind of real system uh, for automation would be really useful if it had those things. Um, so where we live, like I said, we're about two hours from Atlanta, and um, which means it's when you have this, this barn and these animals, the simple things like going down to Atlanta for the day you know, becomes a challenge sometimes because especially if you leave early in the morning, you know, maybe if my daughter has an archery tournament three hours away, we have to leave the house at 4 a.m. to get there. Um, so, you know, it would be cool. It can't substitute, I mean, I couldn't, I would never trust an automation system to go on vacation for a week, you know, but for like a day, it would be something nice to be able to get up early, uh, you know, hit the road, pull up my phone, and open the doors at, at, or schedule the opening of the doors at, you know, sunrise. Uh, schedule the foods or manually trigger the food. So those kind of things would be really useful in a automated system. And also, you know, obviously mechanize the doors. And I wanted to be able to remotely control it. Um, so what I came up with was, um, we'll take a quick look at the overview of the system. And I, I came up with this system, um, and I basically built it as a prototype. And the reason I built it as a prototype was so that I can demo it to you here at the conference. Um, if I were to build this, well, a couple reasons. So I can demo it, and two, because it would be really expensive to buy all the actual, you know, large motors large enough to open doors. Um, gear drives, those kind of things, it, and all the cabling and all the power. It would be kind of expensive to build this full scale. So I built it as a prototype, but nothing about the system and the sensors that are attached to it uh, means that it couldn't actually work at full scale. It's just really easy to demo it to you via this method. So that's what we did. So I want to give you a quick overview of it um, so you kind of understand what you're seeing, and hopefully it'll make sense to you. So up here on the top left, you have some analog and digital sensors. And these are things like temperature sensors, um, pumps, uh, motors, uh, ambient light sensors, things like that. And they're all connected up to an Arduino. An Arduino is just a small microcontroller board. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you program for Arduinos in C++, a slightly modified version of C++. And it has two methods. You have an init method and you have a loop method. So your init method is called as soon as it turns on and starts. You set up things and do whatever you need to do in it to initialize the program. And then the loop method is just ran constantly. So what it does is it reads those sensors every time in that loop method, builds up a big string of JSON, and then it prints it out to the serial, serial port. Um, and when I think about this whole kind of system, I kind of put some analogies with it to help you kind of maybe understand. Uh, and when I think of the Arduino, I think of it as like the heart of the system, right? Without it, the system doesn't work. There will be no sensor data to, to be produced anywhere else. Next up, connected to the Arduino via a USB cable is a Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pi I think of as like the brain of the system. Uh, it's just as crucial as the heart, but it also has some logic involved. It does some little bit of logic to determine what it needs to do with some data. It also has a few sensors, as you can see on the bottom left, uh, just uh, 
because, well, I'll explain that a little later. But it does have a sensor and a webcam attached to it. One of the main reasons I chose this setup, <laughs> well, I chose the Arduino because I never played with an Arduino before and I wanted to play with it. Uh, but actually, there is a semi-decent semi reason why I chose it, uh, and that's because Arduinos can handle analog sensors really well. Uh, Raspberry Pis can too, but um, you need to do a little more work. You need like an analog to digital converter and go through some extra steps and jump through some extra hoops. So the Arduino reads analog sensors really well, and it passes that data over to the Raspberry Pi. Next part of the system here in the middle is a message queue. And um, originally, when I designed this system back in uh, late fall, early winter, I was using a Kafka queue to provide messaging. And right now, it's using uh, what's uh, what it's using an OCI streaming instance, and it's not using an OCI as an object computing. It's using an OCI as an Oracle Cloud infrastructure. And when I said OCI in Madrid, everyone was like, "What? What OCI?" And uh, at least the OCI guys did. They're like, what are you talking about? Um, so it's using OCI streaming, which is uh, Oracle Cloud's uh, streaming option that's very similar to Kafka. And I like to think of this message queue as the stomach, uh, because what do stomachs do? They accept input, and they produce output. There's one guy that always laughs at that. <laughs> um, next up in the system, originally was a Helidon, and now is a Micronaut microservice deployed in a Docker container on Kubernetes. Um, again, this system is like my little playground. Uh, so originally, I did it with Helidon, and I wanted to learn Micronaut after Greach, and I said, "Well, I'm going to rewrite the service in Micronaut," and that's what I did. And we'll take a look at some of that code in a little bit here. Um, I like to think of that as the digestive system. So like your digestive system receives input from your stomach, the microservice receives input from the messaging queue, and it does something with it before it produces its output, just like your digestive system. This is kind of gross, isn't it? Sorry. It's the best I can think of. I'm open to suggestions. But your digestive system absorbs nutrients in your body. So the digestive system micronaut, and that's probably the first time you've ever heard that, um, will take your data and persist it into the uh, database. So just like your body does that. Uh, and the angular front end, no more gross stuff. This is the skin. This is what you see when you look at the system, right? So you see your face or your skin, and that's what the angular system is. Down at the bottom, there's some other pieces. There's an object storage instance that talks to a serverless function that pushes messages to my mobile. And we'll take a look at that here shortly. So let's take a look at the demo. And um, I <coughs> did some, uh, some other reading about Danish culture. And apparently, there's something called failure cake. And I do not want to eat failure cake today <laughs> or failure beer. Uh, so uh, it should work great. Uh, let's, I'm going to mirror this so that it's much easier. And so what I'm doing first is I am opening a VNC connection to the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> There we go. And so this is the Raspberry Pi. I've net remoted into it. And um, on the Raspberry Pi, there is a Groovy jar, uh, a jar created with Groovy, that has a script that um, will produce our data and push it into the message queue. So we can start that script up. And before I do that, here's the web interface. Uh, let me actually let me launch the uh, my webcam here as well. So I'm starting a webcam so that we can see the system in my office. Everybody get off the Wi-Fi. <laughs> Fail 
your cake. There we go. All right, turned on my light. So it's a little laggy because it's not the best webcam in the world, and I have it on a little tripod. Um, but this is my office in Georgia. And here is the web app. So let me tell you a little bit about this. Over here. So over here, we have two beakers of water. In between it is a pump with some hosing that goes to each of them. And the white element in the middle is a water level sensor. And the theory here is that um, to, water, to provide automated watering, I could either have a source bucket or a source barrel, like a 55 gallon barrel of water that would be used to um, provide water to the animals, or I could hook it up to a, a, an actual water source, a water line, and, and have a valve that I could open and shut. Um, the pet bowl represented by the beaker on the right would be what my pig and chickens would drink out of. And the water sensor would tell it when it fell below a specified threshold to turn on the water source and fill it back up to a spe another specified threshold. The item in the middle here is a door made out of Legos. It has a, uh, yeah, hey, Legos Danish, right? Yeah, cool. Um, crappily made out of Legos, and there's a Lego motor from a Techniques kit. Where's Ryan? He's not in here. He would probably, yeah. That's a Technic, uh, is it? You know those little motors? Yeah. It's from the Technics kit, right? Okay, yeah, so it's a Lego Technics motor, and there's a uh, rack that is on top of the door, and then over here there's a LED that represents a light that I would be able to turn on and off. Over here is a Lego pig that costs an absurd amount of money. <laughs> Some of those things are expensive. That thing was like $8 for that pig. <laughs> I'm not joking. And here's another door, and that is a solenoid lock that uh, is powered so I can unlock the door. So for the pig, uh, I wanted to get a Lego um, linear um, actuator, but I haven't gotten that far yet, but, and those are expensive as well. But the, the theory would be that just like an actuator on a door, you could have this mechanical uh, actuator open the door. But in reality, my pig uh, uses his snout to bump the door open. So in reality, all I would have to do is unlock it, and he would be able to nose his way out. Uh, so that's the theory behind that. Um, so behind that, in the gray container, is the system itself. It's all the wires, all the sensors, uh, the Raspberry Pi, the Arduino. It is in a uh, sprinkler system box that I can shut. And if I were to actually deploy it, it would be weatherproof, and I could install it and not have to worry about any of that. Um, so this is the prototype system, and if we are if we are being favored by the demo gods, and we start up the Groovy script, in a couple seconds here, we're going to start seeing some data flowing into the web app. 28 minutes. So it's going to start up here, going through its little things, setting up the streaming endpoints, and we see our barn and we're publishing messages. And we have data. So if we look at the web app, we can see the current temperature in my office is 75, 77, 75 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, 24, 25 Celsius. We have a real-time temperature and humidity chart being populated on the fly. The water level is currently at 56 milliliters in the pet bowl. And the ambient light level is at 580 whatever units that is measuring. <laughs> I don't know, I'm sorry. Um, and then down here we have the ability to take snapshots. So if I click the take snapshot button, uh, what's going to happen is a message is going to be sent back to the Pi. The webcam from the Raspberry Pi is pointed at a digital photo frame. And uh, the thought here is that I could have predator detection via a webcam on the outside of the barn. If any, uh, the area where we live, there's black bears, there's coyotes, there's foxes, there's all kinds of predators. Um, and that's not why I only have six chickens now, but 
um, they could potentially, uh, you know, come after my animals. And so in real time here, we got a picture. And I have some random nature scenes mixed in, to, and we'll see why in a little bit. But in this case, um, this is just a tree scenery, so everything in my simulation here is great. There's no predators to worry about. Um, if we take another one real quick, we'll s when it finally comes in, we'll see that. Um, so yeah, the data is being pushed live. Uh, if we come over here, and let's say we wanted to turn on the light. We would click the turn light on button, and with my slow, laggy webcam, we should see that light come on. Awesome. And if we click the open door button, and take another sip of beer. Cheers. <laughs> so, were you, were you gonna clap? Go ahead, it's fine, you can clap. <laughs> Um, so there's other things we can do. We could unlock the solenoid. It's kind of hard to see over there on the right-hand side, so I won't do that. Um, I have the water currently disabled, and this doesn't really demo all that great, uh, but I'll enable the pump, and it should fill up to 100 milliliters. And so in a few seconds, you should see that. Yeah, there you go, the pump on the left, uh, maybe? Oh, my phone is buzzing. So while we're waiting for that, uh, my phone buzzed because uh, what happened when that picture was taken, it was stored in object storage, and uh, the object storage uh, instance is tied to cloud events, and when every time an object is persisted to... <laughs> every time an object is persisted to that bucket, a cloud event is triggered, and the cloud event calls a serverless function. The serverless function is a, another groovy uh, uh, serverless function, and it does some image analysis via a third-party API, and I really better get moving because we're running low on time and I want to show you code, but th that will actually go and do some analysis. In this case, uh, you can see the result. It's found, uh, apparently, it doesn't see a bear in that picture, but I see a bear. Um, <laughs> but a lot of times it'll find like predator or wolf or something like that. And the, <laughs> I mean, I guess the idea here is to know when there's predators in my yard, but if I'm in Atlanta, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do about it. Um, I did have some thoughts, like maybe I could add like an ultrasonic noise or, or some bright lights that I could trigger and turn on to scare them away. Or, or like somebody said, like Jacob said, a shotgun, maybe, wire to it. <laughs> right? um, so yeah, you can see, I don't know if you noticed, but the water level did go up on the pet bowl over here on the right while we were playing around. And um, yeah, it's still updating on the chart here, but now it's at 100 mils, or right around there. So yeah, so that's cool. That's the demo, and let's take a look at some awesome code now. Where'd the keynote go? Oh, Mac, why do you do this to me? Uh, let me bring it back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my wife will get it. <laughs> I don't want to press my luck. If I click that button again, something might not work. <laughs> all right, this happened to me earlier before you all came in. Look at my cursor. Why is it stuck like that? I think I have to do this. And then plug it back in. Hmm? Sounds like my laptop sounds like a jet engine right now. Uh, uh, we'll close that later. All right. Let's take a look at some code. Um, I'm sorry that I'm running so long here. So the first thing I want to show you is what I call the outgoing flow. And this is the Arduino. Uh, this is 
C++ code. Um, I'm not a C++ expert, but just to give you an idea of what's going on here, uh, within the loop function, we have a collect, not well, the collect temperature function is not within the loop function, but we have a collect temperature function that reads the pin that the sensor is connected to, in this case a temperature sensor. And within the loop function, I build this output buffer, which is just a big uh, array list, whatever you want to call it. And then I read all the sensor data, create JSON objects out of the data contained within, shove, shove it into that big array, and at the very end of the loop method, I print everything out to serial. So this has uh, constantly runs. As soon as Arduino turns on, it's printing out to serial. If nothing's connected, nothing happens, that's cool. The data just stays there in the serial port waiting for uh, nothing to happen. On the next piece, the Raspberry Pi has, uh, this is the Groovy script on the Raspberry Pi, and it checks whether the COM port, the serial port, has any bytes available. If not, it waits a little longer, and um, if it does, it will read the serial port, uh, convert the, the uh, byte array that it reads into a string, parse that string into, uh, parse the JSON in that string, and the reason I do that is sometimes, not often, but sometimes when you read serial, it doesn't read the entire serial output, it kind of cuts off a little bit, not very often, but I want to make sure that I'm dealing with an actual valid array, a JSON array. So I parse it to make sure, uh, and then finally I use a message producer to send that, converting it back to a string, so uh, I can push that message up to the messaging queue. And that's just because all messages sent to the messaging queue have to be a string. The um, Raspberry Pi, this is the message producer. And so this is using the OCI streaming, uh, the, SD, the Oracle Cloud SDK. And we create a message details object, a message details request, put the uh, string that we want to send as a message into it, and finally call put messages. So it's very similar to a Kafka producer. Uh, maybe a few more lines of code, but not much really. We're just sending a message to the message queue, and that's all it takes. So at this point, I kind of realized I had a problem on the microservice side of things. Um, I wanted to consume all of the events that are, are on that topic, even if there's no front-end clients connected. So I didn't want to wait until someone connected to the browser to read these events. Like I said, I wanted to have that persistent data so that I could have that log of events, that I can check things and do analysis and that sort of thing. So I knew that in the microservice, I needed to spawn a thread immediately when an app starts and consume all of those events, again, even if nobody's connected. And at the same time, I did want to push all of the events to connected front-end clients. Now, I could have created two different message consumers and done it that way, kept one in the uh, controller and one in the other thread so that it's always running. But I thought maybe a better uh, solution would be to use the observer pattern. Um, and Jeff, avert your eyes. This code may not be very pretty to you um, because I'm still kind of learning this myself. But basically what I came up with in the microservice and uh, the micronaut side of things was using RxJava to create an event bus. And this event bus is how I would broadcast within the application that an event was read. And if there is a client connected, that it needs to broadcast that out to the client. So I use, uh, like I said, RxJava, create this publish subject, have a send method that calls on next, and sends that barn SSE event to any connected clients. On the consumer side of things, I create a, a cursor over here on the left, and then I start looping over that, uh, the, oh, actually, sorry, I call get get messages, and whatever results I get from that, I loop over. So I read all of the messages from the queue that are available, I loop over them, insert them in the database, create what's what I'm calling a barn SSE event, and calling that event bus.send. So like I said, uh, if there are anybody, any listeners on that event bus, it will notify them. Uh, and then finally, on line 26 there on the right-hand side, I persist it to the database. And uh, so this runs, this consumer runs as soon as the Micronaut application starts, spawns the thread, 
loops over this constantly. And um, I did add some, I have add, recently added some that I didn't update here, some kind of fail-safe logic. Oh no, maybe that's something else. That might be something else. Mm -hmm. Anyways. Um, so on this side of things, this is, uh, I'm not sure if you guys have shown at this conference um, how Micronaut handles server sent events, uh, but it's pretty cool, it's pretty easy. Uh, again, it uses Rx Java, and in your Micronaut, is everyone familiar with server sent events? Yes? Most, most everyone. If you're not familiar, it's kind of, how do I explain it easily? So it's not, it's, it's, it's data pushed from the server to the client, as opposed to polling where your client is polling for data and making constant requests every X seconds, the browser cre opens a connection to the server and it leaves it open in until it wants to close it um, or until there's no more messages available. And the server pushes the messages out to the, uh, the client, the, the browser. Um, so the way Micronaut handles it is you use Rx Java to return this uh, basically, you're returning a publisher of events to the browser. Um, what you see up top there is the way I've created my generator. Uh, and what I do is inside my generator, in the this is in my controller endpoint where the client connects, I create a subscription to that barn event bus that I used previously. And um, every time that that barn event bus broadcasts a message. I use the SSE emitter here to call on next and pass it an event of the uh, object, in this case, a barn SSE event. So it's kind of this weird system where I have one publisher that is listened to in another publisher that kind of, but it all kind of works. And if you have any better ideas and I'm doing something wrong, any of the OCI guys, Please see me afterwards. But it works. So this, every time uh, a client is connected, it, uh, has the, it gets the uh, messages pushed to the browser. And then on line 14 and 15 there, you can see if there's any, if the uh, SSE emitter, emitter is canceled, it calls on complete, and it disposes of the subscription to kind of clean up after itself. So this kind of looks like this. The data comes from the sensors to the Arduino, gets passed to the Pi, to the message queue, to the Micronaut, to the database, and to the front end. Simple. Now, there's also an incoming flow, right? So anytime I click on a button or uh, a link or something, I want something to be able to happen in the reverse direction. So the way I solved this was, um, using Angular posts to the microservice. So I send a message from the browser in a simple post. It is a JSON object. Send it to the browser. And then I have a separate topic on the events uh, on the streaming queue that goes kind of in the reverse direction, right? So the producer is on the microservice side in this case, and the consumer is on the, the Raspberry Pi side as opposed to the other way where it was like that. Um, so it sends a message that way. The Raspberry Pi has a consumer that consumes that topic, and if it gets a message, it writes it to the serial connection. The Arduino reads the serial connection and does what it has to do. So what that looks like is kind of like this. This is uh, the Angular front end. There's a control door function. It uh, has whatever door number I want to control, and it basically, the main point here is down on line 19. It just makes an HTTP post to the barn control endpoint, sending a little JSON message telling it what it needs to do. The microservice, this is the uh, simple uh, HD, uh, the post uh, method on the controller side of the microservice, and it simply calls message producer dot send, and it sends that message in the reverse direction. Con the consumer looks almost identical to the other side. The only difference being here on line seven on the right hand side is I call Arduino service dot send, and that writes to serial, and this is how that looks. It just uses comport dot write bytes, and it prints it to serial. And then the Arduino, it just reads serial, has a big switch case, figures out what it needs to do, figures out what it needs to do it on, and it does it. And obviously that would look like this. 
from the front end to the microservice to the message queue to the Pi to the Arduino and out to the sensors. Now image capture, this is kind of neat and uh, there's a specific reason uh, I want to talk about this and it's kind of fun. So there's a motion sensor that runs on the Pi and, and the again, like I said earlier, the theory is that uh, you would detect motion, it would take a snapshot, and uh, we can also do it on demand as I demoed. Uh, the Groovy script uses a library called Pi4j and it just gives you a way to interact with the Raspberry Pi sensors via a nice Java library. There's an event listener that's created with Pi4j and when it is triggered, it will take a snapshot from the webcam, uploads that to object storage, and it uses the Amazon S3 API. Hello. 10 minutes? Okay. Cool. <laughs> so the cool thing is that it uses the Amazon S3 API. Um, so Oracle Object Storage, like many cloud vendors today, have a fully compatible Amazon S3 endpoint that you can use to um, persist objects to object storage, uh, which means if you were going to migrate over to Oracle Cloud, it would be really easy if you had an application that uses extensively uses the S3 API, you would be able to migrate that after you moved your objects, obviously, and the code would pretty much just work, which is nice. Um, as I said earlier, it triggers a cloud event, which calls a serverless function, which analyzes the image and then sends a notification. Uh, finally, it also sends a message to the queue so that the front end can display that picture uh, when, it, uh, when it's ready. So here's the thread that started, create a listener uh, with Pi4j. When it detects that the pin state is in, uh, the event state is in a high state, it calls camera service and it takes the picture and, and broadcasts that fact. Here's the snap store broadcast creates a, uh, takes the picture using the Raspberry Pi's camera, and on the right-hand side there, as I said, this is the, this is the actual S3 Java SDK dropped in as a dependency in the, in the app, and the actual S3, it's not just me naming it S3 client, it's the actual S3 SDK. Uh, you can create your metadata, create a put object request, and then call put object on the client, and boom, it's all good. Done. Um, this is the cloud event. So cloud events are pretty cool. They're in limited access, limited availability right now. But it gives you the ability to listen to an event like an object persistence, uh, object storage create, uh, object create in an object storage bucket, creation of a bucket, deletion, all those sorts of things will trigger an event that lets you do something with it. Um, you can call a function, serverless function. You can post it to a message stream. You can receive a notification. Um, so it's a lot of cloud providers are kind of going to this, uh, this part of the CNCF. Uh, cloud events are defined by the CNCF. And a lot of cloud providers are providing this ability, which is really nice. Um, they're adding more uh, types of events all the time. Uh, there's database backup events, things like that. So you could receive a notification if you know when the database backup happens. So it's kind of nice. But this is my little hack of using it uh, to use uh, to call a serverless function to do some image analysis. And in this case, I'm using a API called Clarify, which is a third-party service that I found, dropped it in, um, and it gives you the ability to send it an image either as a I think you can send a uh, input stream with the SDK. I'm not 100% sure. I think you can. Uh, or you can just send it a URL that points to the image, and it will do the image analysis on it and give you those keywords that it detected. So again, like I said, if I wanted to notify notification only when a predator is detected, I could do that, or I could just send it every time. In this case, I'm sending it every time. Uh, and this is just the notification uh, so again, the, um, Amazon has SNS, for example, just using a simple notification uh, service to broadcast this. Um, there's one other little hack in here, and that is that our current service doesn't have SMS support, so mobile, you know, text message support. So I have it set up to send a email to my text message phone number. So you just use your phone number 
and then every provider has a spe specific email address that will send it as a text message. So that's the only little hack I have in here. Um, and that looks like, you know what that looks like, come on. Six minutes. What was that? So persistence, and this is one thing I do want to show you because it's really cool. So as I said, I use Oracle Autonomous DB, our cloud database offering, uh, and that particularly the service called Autonomous Transaction Processing. And what I do here is I store JSON data in a traditional database table. Um, when I first came up with this system, uh, I sent it out, and my, who is now my boss, Gerald, uh, who wasn't then, sent it back to me and said, why don't you use, this, use ATP for this? And I said, well, it's just, it's dynamic, unstructured data. You know, I'm just using Mongo to store it and pull it out. He goes, oh, you could do that in ATP. I said, what, you can? So apparently, most, and I can't believe I didn't know this, but um, most major RDBMS have JSON column support nowadays, and you can put an actual JSON string in a column, which you could always do, right? I mean, nothing ever stopped you from shoving it in a Varkar Max column. But the fact is, you can actually query that data with this support, which is really cool. So here's an insert. Uh, my barn event is shown on the left, and on the right, we just in use plain old SQL to insert this into the barn event table. I have a type column, a data column, and a captured at. So the data is just the actual event data itself. So the temperature data, the uh, water level data, the door sensor data, those kind of things. And like I said, that's all unstructured, right? Every event could be different. So if I were to do this in the traditional manner, I would have to create a temperature event table, Celsius column, Fahrenheit column, you know. And I didn't want to mess with all that because I wanted it to be dynamic. What if I wanted to add some data to this structure or this event? What if I created a new event? I didn't want to have to mess with the database every time that I you know, added or changed events. So here's the really cool thing about it. You can actually write queries like this, and you can see here that I have select all from barn event where data.fahrenheit is greater than 75. So this will actually treat that data, that JSON data, as basically almost like a first-class citizen in the database. It can actually query based upon the elements within the data. So I thought that was a pretty cool thing, and uh, it works out really nice for me. Gives me the ability to store that unstructured data as well as still query it later on. Um, so yeah, summary, we have three minutes, awesome. So like I said, um, at least for me, and I don't know if it's because I, I didn't go to university for programming, but I always like to use personal problems when learning these new things or, or uh, trying to understand something. To me, it works out so much better than, uh, and not that there's anything wrong with the simple guides or, or, you know, hello world apps, but when I actually dig into a problem and solve it, it leads me to ask more questions about it. How does it do this? How does it support this? How can I do this? Maybe it doesn't. You know, I learn all those things that you would use, you know, if you used it on a real client project or something, but it gets, you know, it's fun. You're interested in it. You're, you're, you're doing something that you love, so you're motivated by it, and it helps you learn more easily. Uh, message streaming and queues are awesome. I had never worked with Kafka or anything before about a year ago, and um, they're really handy. They're really helpful. Uh, they're not as kind of one dimension as I thought they might be. Um, complex problems do not require complex solutions. Uh, all my codes on GitHub, you can go take a look at it. There's nothing groundbreaking. There's nothing that's going to blow your mind. Be like, oh, this is, uh, you know, there's no huge, they're all just small, tiny little apps. Um, I, wrote, I wrote two versions in Node because, again, I wanted to play around and learn more about Node. So I wrote a Pi client and a microservice client in Node. Um, but none of it's really super complex. It's really kind of straightforward. It's a good example to me of how different architectures can, and different languages and dependencies can work together easily. Um, you know, in the monolith era, we always were stuck on, uh, you know, you're using Grails 3, and the entire app has to use Grails 3, and your dependency on Spring Security, one dot, whatever. You were always locked into that for your entire application. But now, in this microservice era that we're in, and I don't, everybody knows this, you know, it, it, there's b benefits to that, and they're awesome. And I have one minute left. Real-time data push is possible with server-sent server events. 
And finally, as you just saw, JSON documents in a traditional RDBMS. Here is my contact info. If you would like to talk to me on Twitter, I would love to be your friend. Um, my email address, if you need to get a hold of me for any reason. Uh, I'm recursive, my blog is recursive.codes. Uh, yeah, here's some resources. And thank you. Cheers. Skull.